All right, so let's dive right in. Uh, lightning look at 2022 Eclipse Adoptium in review. And no, I don't rhyme everything uh, during this presentation, so bear with me. Before we actually look at last year, wanted a very brief look at the whole history of the project. I think most of you know that this project started off as Adopt Open JDK back in 2017. So as we arrived at the start of 2022, we were celebrating a five-year anniversary. Um, so I want to set that into context and also noting that um, along this timeline in 2022, uh, a, lot, a big effort was made uh, um, at the project to move into the Eclipse Foundation and we were joined by a wonderful set of working group members. And at, as of today, we have um, you know, quite a healthy set of members looking for more members, of course, but we've seen wonderful growth. A lot of other um, kind of quick stats. I won't go into detail on these. Uh, I do want to mention that I'll talk about some of these um, as we go forward a little bit more. You'll see a strike through through the 166 releases in 22. What? We didn't do that many releases? Actually, we ended up doing more releases than 166. And what I mean by releases, GA builds that were released as uh, artifacts to the community because of respins on a couple of the uh, release periods, um, we actually did a lot more than this number. Uh, but if you act, if we take into account that for each one of these, we run 350,000 tests per release, that means really millions and millions and millions of tests exercised on a large set of platforms across or four, actually five versions, if you count our EA and nightly builds. So a lot of uh, underlying work has to happen just to keep this uh, project humming as it has done over uh, the course of the year. Um, and for those who don't know or haven't really looked at the project hierarchy recently, um, we are structured as a top-level project called Adoptium, and it has some sub-projects, Temerin, Aquavit, Temerin Compliance, Mission Control, EMT4J, or Migration Toolkit for Java, and the Incubator Project. And so I just wanted to uh, point out that we're more than just one project. Uh, we're actually a lot of different repositories a lot of different committers and contributors that make up uh, Eclipse Adoptium and make up this wonderful community that we're, we have here. Again, one more kind of top level view of the world. Uh, because most of the activity at the project revolves around us producing releases of Temerin, Eclipse Temerin is our uh, OpenJDK distribution. Having this view of the world can be helpful for people at the project because these swim lanes as you see them describe really most of the activities that are happening during a release period. So we have that top swim lane, uh, which is a JDK production uh, lane. We have then once we produce these tar balls, um, we produce other uh, types of packages that go out to the community, so installers, Docker, or container images. Uh, we have a whole series of people working on our comms and marketing pieces and how we communicate out to the rest of the world. We have a very large uh, activity around testing, both testing for quality, which is that Aquavit swim lane, and uh, testing for compliance, which is the TCK swim lane. And then um, with all of these activities, we end up um, keeping the project healthy by doing retrospectives and always assessing and adjusting. 
So I would say one of the biggest strengths of 2022 and what makes this community successful is this bottom swim lane called assess or assessment. And really it's an assess and adjust. So when we do things, look at how we did them at, with a critical eye and adjust accordingly so that we can always be improving. All right, so into the highlights. And by the way, a lightning talk is meant to be five minutes. So when I hit some of these highlights, they won't have everything that we've done in the year. And I apologize if I've missed things. I'll want to open up the conversation uh, after the call, after the presentation as well to say, what else did we miss on these slides? And I'll update them accordingly. Um, or just interrupt as I go to say, hey, what about? <laughs> but for the top level project Adoptium, as you recall, we had, I had listed seven repositories and actually through the good work of um, collapsing some of those into a single website repository, we will be moving to the four repositories. Three of them are now archived. So reducing technical debt by simplification, but in terms of growth of the overall project, uh, we saw in 2022 three new working group members, new sponsors, three new PMC members, a new community manager, new committers on all, on many of the projects that we have under Adoptium, and many new first-time contributors through some of our outreach work. We also lifted up the Adoptium Marketplace, which was a major milestone in the first two happening just into the second quarter of 2022. And there are seven vendors listing their products in that marketplace. Um, and so kudos to all the good work and the folks that made that happen. And as mentioned uh, for our outreach here, that consolidation uh, a, a brand new website created, consolidation of documentation in the blog into it, and uh, 14 blog posts at the project. I'm not going to list external articles as well, but there were many, uh, as well as webinars, as well as um, conference talks. We can probably put all of that into a summary um, at the end of this as an exercise into the final weeks of December, just to say, hmm, not too bad. But I know this also happens in the project's program plan. So um, expect to see as we go into 2023 that we will be assessing what goals we've set for ourselves in 2023 throughout the year to see where we're at. And things like blog posts and uh, conference talks all get kind of tallied into that program plan review. Happy to see some of our uh, outreachy interns here today as well. Uh, we participate in many different open source programs. And in 2022, we participated in CAN OSP, which is a Canadian university open source program. Google Summer of Code in the summer. And uh, we finished off a 2021 December to March uh, 2022 cohort at the start of the year, and I've just begun uh, a new outreachy term here in December with the contribution period happening in October of 2022. And, and then of course our uh, talks and interactions at EclipseCon was a, a pretty good highlight of the overall project this year. I'm going to break down now uh, as best I can. And again, knowing that I'm supposed to have been done this talk already, five minute lightning talk, it will go long <laughs> because there were so many great accomplishments in the projects that are the sub projects underneath the top level Adoptium project. So Temerin being one of the most active projects, it is the project where we do build and distribution. So uh, our, our money maker, if you will, if we made money, <laughs> is uh, producing Temerin binaries and distributing them to the community in various forms. Um, 
And one of the biggest kind of pieces of work, uh, and I'll, it gets to go in the highlight reel here, is the effort around secure software development. And you'll see a couple of acronyms there, SSDF and SALSA. These are frameworks that help projects like ours uh, move towards greater security. So SSDF coming out of the US government NIST uh, definition and SALSA is uh, the framework, um, I guess originally out of Google, but uh, being picked up uh, at the Eclipse Foundation as a way that projects can um, declare where they're at in terms of secure software development. And happy to say that it's also level two has been achieved in uh, this fourth quarter of 2022 through the a lot of uh, good effort and work here under the Temerin banner. You'll see we also broke out uh, some of this into milestones. If you see M1, M2, M3 listed on slides, these are just where we had uh, decided to uh, bundle a bunch of features and say, we're going to try to get this set of features completed by a certain date on a timeline. So for SSDF M1, uh, that included an initial SBOM being created and an assessment against the SSDF checklist and identifying some gaps uh, that we would know we had to work on. Um, and interestingly, the initial SBOM uh, happened or was initiated as an outreachy project um, and worked on initially there. Uh, we are now seeing, and I think we have uh, perhaps Julian uh, making progress, he's up probably on the call here, um, for our, our refinements to the SBOM. But M2 here in, includes some more SBOM enhancements um, and some consumer outreach. So what does that mean actually talking to people about how they consume Tamarin binaries, understanding what um, our enterprise consumers are doing in their software intake pipelines so that we make sure that we're producing the right things and the things that are of value to the community. And you'll see here another major milestone, reproducible OpenJDK builds. So uh, broken out into M1, M2, M3, uh, led uh, by Andrew Leonard, who's done uh, just a phenomenal job here of um, identifying what needed to happen, upstreaming the patches to the OpenJDK project, and uh, the whole team really working on making sure we had the tools and the support uh, jobs to be able to make this a little bit easier. So M1 saw uh, work on the Linux platform, M2 Mac, M3 happening in this fourth quarter as well, Windows, and this is right now addressing JDK 17 and JDK 19 plus. Build and distribution highlights here also include a lot of work um, to free us from the need to code freeze during releases. Um, and thanks Juan for the efforts there that you've been doing. Uh, to be able to build from tags or specific SHAs gives a flexibility to this project and also allows us to continue development as part of, you know, if we're in a open source project and people are doing work, they're not asked to freeze for three weeks on, um, anymore. We'll be able to um, kind of have two streams of activity going at once. Uh, during 2022, there were, we also completed a complete overhaul of the Linux installer pipeline, um, producing those uh, installers to a new instance on Artifactory. And thanks to sponsors, um, probably overloading them with <laughs> the number of requests for these uh, these um, packages. But uh, and there's a lot of container automation that also happened during this time. So how do we do our job better with less uh, need for manual interaction? How do we 
lift that burden off of individuals so that we can do more great things uh, instead of having to plug along at manual tasks. So we also um, see we have some UBI minimal Docker images added uh, as part of our set here. So we've been trying to keep a very tight um, containment field around containers to make sure that we don't have a problem with being able to maintain things, but this is a natural uh, extension of what we do, building off official container images, um, making sure that we're able to have secure products coming out of our shops. Uh, and then just, uh, this is too small of a bullet to uh, encompass all of the great work happening just on the infra infrastructure side alone. Um, many hours and uh, uh, effort goes into maintaining a large set of build and test machines that we have, but also to be able to move us up and off into containers so that we are, I guess, resilient and buoyant and able to be a more secure shop where we can be on, with certain platforms. I know there was a major Nagios cleanup, and this is how we monitor the health of all of this infrastructure network that we heavily use on a day-to-day -day basis. And just noting that during 2022, new platforms were added into the mix. So learning how to build on those, but also being able to manage and properly set up those machines um, when they're needed, uh, all happening in this past year. All right, I better go faster here. But Aquavit is probably the other very active project underneath the Adoptium uh, banner and uh, a long list of features and activities happening in 2022. One of the big ones being the marketplace support. So as mentioned in the Adoptium slide, we lifted up uh, an, an entirely new Adoptium marketplace where those seven vendors are listing their products one of the criteria for listing in the marketplace is actually having all of those uh, products listed there pass the Aquabeat verification. So 2022 saw us um, <clears throat> have official releases coming out of the Aquabeat project. In fact, six official releases have us put in place a way that we can pin to specific versions and SHAs of upstream test materials so that we can say everyone is testing against the same set of material and being able then for them to produce output that is uh, browsable by consumers of the marketplace. Break very quickly out now on these highlights of the different layers of Aquavit, the base layer or test kit gen, TKG. A lot of, a lot of great features coming in. I'm highlighting only a few of them being able to support nested iterations doesn't mean much to many of you, but what this actually uh, includes is uh, having various exit options. So if I'm trying to rerun something and I, I only need to know that it can pass once, I can run it a hundred times and put an exit option on it to say exit on a pass. Or conversely, I wanna see it fail once in that X number of iterations I have, exit on a fail, or run me the full run of X number of iterations. Why we're doing these features is that it means we can utilize our resources in a smarter way, and we're always thinking about how to do that. Um, new information in tap files, again, this speaks to the marketplace support. Make sure that we can have in those test anything protocol files information about the thing under test. So we know specifically that when there's a set of tap files being produced and shared in the marketplace material, uh, we can look and say, ah, yes, these all match. And this, all of this uh, proof that you ran and passed Aquavit looks right. There was also microarchitecture support added into TKG. So you may want to run on a certain platform and a certain architecture. And in, within that architecture, a certain microarchitecture. 
uh, and we'll be able to slice and dice tests and say, okay, I only want this for this type of microarchitecture and exclude tests otherwise. On the CI layer, uh, many of you know, we already run in Jenkins, but also uh, uh, in GitHub as a GitHub action. So um, we added TKG parallelism in that GitHub action um, repository run aqua. What this means is you can fire up a test and split it across those GitHub runners um, on, uh, in a way that means you can finish all of that Aquavit verification within an hour if you're utilizing your up to 20 free runners at a time. Uh, Jenkins Auto Rerun, this is a major uh, new feature that has come in at the end of the year. We haven't fully leveraged it yet, but this means that instead of people manually having to rerun grinders, we'll be able to set a flag that says, okay, you failed, um, we're going to kick off things uh, automatically and report on it. And that support has gone into both the CI layer and the TRSS layer. So TRSS, um, I should mention here in CI layer as well, because uh, Temerin compliance is the test for conformance piece, uh, we do a lot of the automation work in the Aquavit project. Um, there's no point having separate ways of running um, and, and building test material for compliance versus test material for quality. So there were a lot of uh, major pieces of work that came in to improve Tamarin compliance work as well in 2022. But since that's a special project, uh, not really an open project, I won't go into detail about these. Uh, needless to say, we do a lot of uh, time, we put a lot of time and effort into that Tamarin compliance piece and making it easier to do things is an important <laughs> way that we save time, effort, and headaches. <laughs> TRSS, this is that top level test result summary service. This is how we take a look at the grand view, the grand scheme of things. Um, this is the only way to stay sane if you wanna look at an entire set of test results for a release pipeline and we, Added a lot of enhancements here as well. Added a tree view, um, added uh, enhancements to the grid view and release summary. Uh, we are on our milestone one of uh, being able to pull in the tap files from the different vendors, upload them and visualize them also in grid view. But other pieces that aren't directly in TRSS, but how we manage it. So uh, added a TRSS sync job, which means anytime there are changes now to the code base, those can be synced automatically to the actual live instance of TRSS. So thanks, Lan, a lot for that, plus adding Netlify. So now when we want to review code that's coming into TRSS, we can actually see a preview of what the GUI looks like, which has been a game changer for everyone. Finally, uh, throwing all these features in the bottom, but uh, really each one of them were major pieces of work. I had already mentioned auto rerun. You'll notice that there's a whole new row in that little icon grid view called dev. It's a new level of testing. And we added that so that uh, develop to support development work and uh, to be able to onboard new tests that maybe aren't yet ready for being added into the aqua verification piece maybe they're a little flaky maybe they're new and we need to observe them so they can go into this dev level a lot of external test enhancements and uh, supporting of new jvm features so supporting uh, criu has been a major um, piece of work so uh, having the workflow to to be able to checkpoint and restore things and run tests from a restored um, image has been uh, happened in 2022 and continues into 2023. A new AquaTest pipeline to give us flexibility on the remote trigger. Um, some new tests being added uh, from both Red Hat and Alibaba. 
and then uh, having to support the new platforms that are also coming into the project. Whew. All right, a few other uh, project highlights from the sub-projects. Wanted to say kudos to Mission Control with their three releases. Um, EMT4J is actually a new project in 2022, and there is a wonderful blog post uh, at the website uh, that you can read all about it. But congratulations for that new project to be added. The incubator, a lot of uh, work still on the fast startup incubator repository. And there's a uh, another wonderful blog post talking about that work. Uh, and then uh, Temer and Compliance, as mentioned, we do, we spend a lot of time and effort here um, and many automation improvements coming in via the Aquavit and Temerin pipeline updates that uh, you may see uh, going through those repositories. Oof. Getting really near the end, this is really, I failed at a lightning talk, but uh, maybe maybe succeeded at a look at 2022. Um, looking at what happened and when it happened in the year, just a little bit of a timeline. So you can see that we have to intersperse those milestones in amongst a very um, serious number of release activities. And this is kind of how some of those things laid out over the course of 2022. And we expect to be building a same kind of timeline for 2023. <clears throat> but I, I do have to say that uh, apparently we just didn't have to do any work in February or May, and those must have been great months last year, right? <laughs> no, I. what I really wanted to say was uh, kudos to everyone who work at this project, especially those who work at this project on a regular basis. Uh, this is a grueling set of deliverables, and you should be really, really uh, proud of the work you do here. And, and the pace that you're able to keep. And I think we do that through teamwork and collaboration and communication. All right, well, that is the uh, look at 2022. And I guess uh, if I'm gonna summarize it at all, I'm gonna say it was a big year. And thanks to everyone who contributed to the project in 2022. Uh, I don't wanna scare you, but I think 2023 looks bigger. <laughs> We will have new challenges, uh, big goals, but I expect it will also be in a lot of collaboration and fun and uh, really good work to everyone. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all in uh, 2023.